If you could turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 11, this morning. While you're turning there, you know, one of the most fundamental and, dare I say, life-changing decisions that we will ever make in this life is the decision we make to look at our Christian life and what we call our Christian life, what we call our walk with God, as either a got-to or a get-to. You know, it's very easy for us to find ourselves drifting from the passion, the freedom, the joy we initially had in our walk with God, and finding what we call our walk with God becoming an exercise in rote and routine and dead ritual. And it's not a new problem. Way back in the book of Malachi, uh, Malachi is a fascinating book because it's almost like God does a 60 Minutes style Mike Wallace interview with the people of Israel. He asks them some really tough questions. And one of the questions that he asked right off the bat was to the priests of Israel. Why have you treated my altar like it was a trivial kind of a thing? And he caught, takes him to task about the kind of sacrifices that were being offered. People were going, oh, well, we got old tripod out here in the South 40. We're not going to use him anyway. Let's offer him to the Lord. And God said, uh, try offering something like that to your governor and see if he's impressed. And I'm a great king. But one of the most fascinating lines that God brings out as far as what was going on in Israel and their worship is found in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 13 where they say, Oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord. Oh, what a weariness. Have you ever felt that way about some particular spiritual aspect of your walk with God? Oh, I know we're sitting there thinking, oh, yeah, Malachi, boy, give it to those priests back then. We don't have priests. We don't have a temple. Man, uh, I, I love messages like that. But let's bring it a little closer to home. Stop and think about the spiritual disciplines that are a part of your life. Yeah, is Bible study something you do because you get to or because you got to? Is getting together and fellowshipping with God's people something you do because it builds you up and encourages you and gives you the opportunity to build into the lives of others and it's a joy? Or is it kind of like, well, eating Brussels sprouts? Uh, we don't really enjoy it, but we do it because we know it's good for us. Hey, try this one on for size. Oh, what a weariness. Does that ever apply to your prayer life? Oh, I, I will openly confess to you, I've been in some prayer meetings where someone was going on for 25 minutes in a single prayer. This is kind of weariness right now. But when it comes to your own prayer life, do you pray because you're worried about what's going to happen if you don't? Man, I'll never find a parking place downtown if I don't have a prayer time. Well, I better do it. Oh, man, you know, I, I know that uh, God's probably got a lightning bolt with my name on it or, or you know, some kind of irritation is going to happen in my life unless I spend some time praying. And, and when we adopt that attitude, the joy goes right out of our Christian life. Well, how can we restore the joy, the excitement, the get-to instead of the got-to, to our prayer life. How can we be people that look at prayer not as a ritual, not as a routine, not as something we do because it's good for us, but a living connection with the true and living God who loves to hear from you personally as his children? Well, in Luke chapter 11, uh, a study that we could call spiritual static, its cause and cure, we'll learn a thing or two about how to make sure we're not drifting into that kind of religiosity regarding what needs to be the highlight moment of our relationship with God, being able to speak with Him, being able to commune with Him through the avenue of prayer. We're going to see Jesus paint for us a very vivid picture of the kind of attitude that will determine our altitude in prayer. 
He's going to make us some fantastic promises and shows us the kind of priorities that we need to have. If prayer is really going to be in our lives, everything God designed it to be. So but before we go any further in all of this, let's take a moment and let's pray. And let's ask the Lord to speak to our hearts very personally and individually about this crucial area of our walk with God. Lord, as we come before you this morning, what an amazing thought it is that as we speak here in this auditorium, our very words are heard by you, the true and living God in heaven. Lord, I pray that that would sink into our hearts for just a moment. That we don't just do this because it's this time in the service or, or because we would expect that as, as part of the routine of going to church. But that you are listening, Lord. That your eyes search to and fro throughout the earth to strongly support those who call upon you in truth. That's what we desire, Lord. We desire to understand that prayer is truly speaking and communicating with you. And Lord, if it has drifted into something else, I pray that you would reveal that to us. But even more importantly, show us how we can trade up, how how we can not settle for just the dull, dry routine of doing the right thing, but instead make our time with you an absolute delight. Oh Lord, I pray that we'd hear the words of Jesus and we would take them to heart and that we would leave here today with some really important insights straight from your hand about what it means for us to have an exciting and growing walk with you. Please, Lord, make our prayer life a get-to in our day, not a got-to. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you are with us last week in Luke chapter 11, Jesus, well, he's asked a question by his disciples that's pretty unique in a sense we think about the disciples and their interaction with Jesus, it's fascinating how oftentimes we see them getting it wrong. And we see them bickering about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. We've seen uh, James and John uh, threatening to call down fire on some Samaritans they thought weren't giving them their propers. Uh, We see Peter uh, completely misunderstanding the meaning of the transfiguration. And and we roll our eyes and cluck our tongues and go, oh, silly disciples. Well, let's face it, Uh, when we see the disciples, we catch human beings in the act of being themselves. And uh, truth be told, I think one of the reasons we like to look back on them and uh, give them uh, sort of the uh, dismissal is because it gets our eyes off of us and and onto them and and off of our faults and failures. But the, the disciples got a lot of things wrong, but here's one they got right. They looked at Jesus, and after he had ceased praying, boy, that Jesus, man, when he prays, God listens. When he prays, uh, he is just so renewed by the experience. It is something that he does often. It's something he does well. I know. Let's ask him to teach us to pray. Now, this wasn't the first time that Jesus had taught his disciples to pray. If you're familiar uh, with the uh, book of Matthew, chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus dealt with with the subject of prayer in quite some detail. And it's fascinating how two years have gone by since the first time the disciples heard Jesus speak about prayer and raising this question here in Luke chapter 11. And I kind of got the, uh, get an idea of what was going through their minds. I'm sure at this point they were saying to themselves, oh, okay, you know, uh, Jesus had some really wonderful things to say about prayer a couple years ago. We've been walking with him for a long time now. I bet we're ready for the really good stuff. Boy, I bet he's really going to take us deep in the subject of prayers. He's going to show us uh, now that we have had some experience under our belt and some education what prayer is really all about. Well, if you were this last week, Jesus' answer to their request was by sharing with them a version of what we know as the Lord's Prayer. It was the very same prayer that he shared with them two years ago with one interesting difference. The prayer that Jesus shares with them here in Luke chapter 11 is 11 words shorter than the prayer he shared with them in Matthew chapter 6. In other words, Jesus was going to elaborate. He was going to simplify. He was going to say, hey, 
This is where it is. And we talked a bit about the Lord's Prayer, how it's not something that we should uh, memorize and learn to say as rapidly and with no meaning as, as, as we possibly can. It's not a lucky rabbit's foot for our walk with God. But it is a structure to our prayer lives. And I know as soon as the subject of structure and prayer life comes up. Some people get a little nervous. Maybe you come from a heavy-duty religious background where everything was all about structure. But understand, there's a real value to having a structure, a format to your prayer life. Let's face it. Prayer is a very interesting relationship, a unique relationship unlike any other. When we pray, we are talking to somebody we can't see, right? Uh, communication experts tell us that over 80% of communication is nonverbal. We, we pick up cues from people's expressions and, and the look on their face and so forth. You can't do that when you're praying. Uh, when you pray, you can't touch God physically. You can only relate to Him spiritually. When we pray, you're not going to hear God audibly. Well, uh, there's been some exceptions to that rule. If that ever happens to you, please tell me what he had to say. But uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, it is a unique kind of communication. And because it's so unique, because it's so different from anything else we ever do communication-wise, it's very easy to drift, isn't it? Very easy to start out with good intentions in our prayer life and and find ourselves, well, our minds wandering, and, and what we thought was a time with God is really anything but. You know, in, in fact, if we talk to anybody else in our lives the way oftentimes we talk to God, our, our relationships would probably be on life support. So Jesus gives us an antidote for that. Make sure there's some structure to your prayer life. And we talked a bit about the elements of a, a healthy prayer life last week how it begins with praise, that is that upward focus on God, hallowing the name of our true and living God, our heavenly Father, emphasizing that relationship we have with Him, how we are to pray for His kingdom to come, how there's that Maranatha aspect of the kingdom, that Jesus could come at any time and the wise person lives accordingly. We need to remind ourselves of that fact. We are on borrowed time. But there is also a mystery form of the kingdom, of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And we need to constantly and daily renew ourselves in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're not going to get very far in this life. We also talked about having God's priorities for our life. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what security and peace we can have as we take the things that matter most to us and give them into the hands of one who's never said oops in the entire history of the creation. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God wants to take care of our provisions. He wants to meet our needs, not our greeds. We can talk to him about those things we lack or, or, or our worries about our finances and, and our resources. And forgive us our sins. God wants to cleanse us. He wants us to keep short accounts on those things that could come in and corrode and corrupt our lives. As we forgive those who sin against us, he wants to make us gracious people. And finally, he wants us to experience his protection Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Yeah, there is an enemy of our souls out there, but the good news is greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And you have this structure to your prayer life. Chances are you're not going to drift. Chances are you're going to find yourself praying about those things that God himself wants you to be praying about within your life. And it's a beautiful and a wonderful thing. But Jesus isn't going to leave it there. We need to have a great structure in our prayer lives. And if you wanted to put it all in a box and put a ribbon on top of it, what the Lord's Prayer reminds us of is one glorious word, providence. That God is looking over us as his people. That there is nothing that escapes his notice in our lives. It's a, a fantastic truth to take with you no matter what kind of challenges you're facing in life. But Jesus is also going to deal with another subject. A subject, dare I say, that those who are, well, part of this neck of the woods in the evangelical Christian circle, uh, our neck of the woods, really need to pay attention to, and that is passion in our prayer life. He's going to illustrate this with a fantastic story that he tells. In Luke chapter 11 and verse 5, we pick it up there. It says, and he said to them, which of you have a friend? 
and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, let me lend you three loaves, uh, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give you. I say to you, though he will not arise and give to him because he's his friend, yet because of his persistence, you might want to underline that word, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Now, here we see an incident taking place that Jesus describes here that, uh, in a sense, wasn't too all uncommon in Jewish circles. An individual finds himself with a friend who drops in at midnight. Now, the language in this particular passage seems to indicate that this particular friend might have gotten lost along the way, hence his arriving at a late hour. But what we don't understand about Jewish culture, and we need to understand in this set of circumstances, is that if you had a friend who was coming to visit you, understand, if you didn't have something to put before him, a decent meal. You know, let's face it, this guy's been on the road and so forth. If you didn't have bread to set before him at that time, it was not uh, just considered, well, a uh, social blunder, right up there with belching at the dinner table or slurping your soup. It was considered a, a high form of personal insult. And, and, and so the lot was on riding on the line here. Why didn't this person have bread? Well, unlike our culture, we have grocery stores and, you know, uh, check, you know corner uh, uh, stores where you can get uh, stuff in a, in a moment at any time, 24 hours a day. Uh, bread in that culture was baked in the morning. Generally speaking, they would only provide enough to get through the day. That way it would promote the idea of freshness and, and so on. And so you would pretty much estimate what you needed, and by the end of the day, it'd be all but gone. Well, this fellow had done that. They had gone through their day's supply of bread, and lo and behold, this friend of his shows up at midnight. He's got nothing. And so he goes to his friend. You've heard the old expression, a friend in need is a friend indeed. Well, this guy is the friend indeed poster child here. Because he says, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on a journey. I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within. Now, notice the response. Do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. Now, to understand this guy's response, you have to understand the layout of the average middle-class Jewish house of that day. It was uh, essentially a one-room situation, one great room. You would have one-third of the house uh, dedicated to a place where there's a little bit of an elevation, about 8 to 10 inches, and that would be the place where the family would sleep, where they would cook, where they would basically do their family thing. You say, Scott, what about the other two-thirds? You know what the other two-thirds was devoted to? Livestock. They would keep their livestock right there in their houses, especially at night. It was the best way to keep predators off them and so on. I don't know if you've ever had the situation where, say, the kitty litter box got a little full and you had to smell that sort of thing, and you know, this was a lifestyle for these people. But you know how it works. After a while, you know, you go into sensory overload, and you don't smell it anymore, but that's essentially what was going on. What this guy is saying is, hey, everybody up here on the, the upper third is in bed. If I get up, go through the livestock, get them all stirred up, my children, the word children here refers to the kind of children uh, that uh, were, say, from toddlers on down. Boy, I'll tell you, once you get those kids in bed, <laughs> you want them to stay in bed, right? You know, one of the things they never tell us in those preparation for parenthood classes, uh, getting ready for the arrival of a uh, little junior or juniette, as the case may be, is the wonderful experience with sleep deprivation that comes with them. I think that's why God makes them so cute. If he hadn't made them so cute, the species would never perpetuate itself. But if you really want to bless somebody at a, a, a baby shower, uh, can I give you a recommendation? Get them one of those wind-up swings that you can put the kid in. Now, some of you already know what I'm talking about because it's not even fair. You put one of those, you, you try everything with a kid, you, you feed them, you rock them and all this stuff. You put them in one of those swings, you wind up and boom, they're out. It, it, it's a real, real blessing. Now, this guy's going, oh, yeah, yeah, you don't know my kids. 
I finally got him down. Maybe you are a parent who had a light sleeper as a kid, a, a kid that just wasn't going to go to bed. Boy, I could tell you stories. But the long and the short of it is this guy is like, hey, everybody's all batting down. And if I get up and stir everybody out, nobody getting any sleep tonight. I can't help you out right now. Well, notice what the response of his friend is. He said, I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he's his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. <laughs> this friend ain't taking no for an answer. He's going to keep after it till he gets a response. I call your attention to that word persistence there. It's a fascinating word in the original language. It is only used once in the entire Bible, and it's right here. Now, it's translated persistence in your New King James Bible, but if you have a different translation of the Bible, you may notice some different takes on all of this. Because this vivid word is one that, well, even the Greek scholars have a hard time fully giving you the nuance on. Maybe the best word to describe what's translated as persistence in your Bible here is kind of a different word. It can be translated audacity. I mean, a person that is definitely going to break all conventions an individual that is going to let nothing stop them until they receive what they need. This guy is bold, man. I'll tell you, uh, I went to college with uh, a couple of people that uh, used to uh, pull off all kinds of uh, outlandish, outlandish and audacious pranks. And, and one of them said, you know, Scott, the only time you get nailed is you go halfway. Well, an audacious person doesn't know the meaning of going halfway, right? An audacious person is going to be passionate. They're going to be focused. They are going to keep on asking till they get what they desire. Now, how interesting. Some commentators look at this particular story that Jesus tells and try to put this together in terms of prayer. And some of them will say, you know, well, you know, the point of the story is that God is kind of like the guy with his children in bed. And, you know, he's not really willing to give you what you want. You got to kind of keep after him. I, I think that takes this totally out of context. The hero of this story, believe it or not, is the pesky neighbor who isn't going to take no for an answer. The audacious guy, the in-your-face guy. That's the kind of attitude in prayer, Jesus is teaching here. Now, <laughs> I need to share something with you. We have oftentimes warned you about the excesses of what is called the faith movement. Uh, and I think it's a misnomer because they tell you to have faith in your faith instead of faith in God. Uh, you know, they get into the uh, name it and claim it and blab it and grab it, scriptures out of context. They tell you how you can write your own ticket with God, how you can pretty much boss God around and tell him uh, what his business is, and all of that is very, very dangerous. But I also have to confess to you, in the first few years of my walk with God after I got saved, I was involved with a Fellowship of Christian Athletes group, and a couple of the coaches got really involved uh, with the, the word faith movement. And I was very much influenced early on by, you know, I guess we would call them hyper-charismatic churches and faith movement teaching that says, you know, you should come to God and you should come to God and you should tell Him what you want. You should believe God until you see the answer. And again, there's excesses here. But there's also a danger, dare I say, if we're going to be honest here this morning among ourselves, of what goes on in our neck of the Christian woods. Our neck of the Christian woods, generally speaking, when it comes to prayer, we're not audacious, are we? You know, we'll float up a prayer to God and, you know, because we know it's the right thing to do. But let's face it, a lot of times we're really not expecting an answer, are we? We're not really boldly coming before the Lord and saying, Lord, I am praying to you today because I believe you are going to radically intervene in my life. We do it because it's the right thing, but, you know, we don't really expect God to act. One thing I will say in favor of those that are involved with the faith movement, those who are involved in hyper-charismatic churches, 
Because I'll tell you what, when they pray, they expect God to answer. They expect to see responses to their prayers. And that's the kind of attitude that Jesus is commending here. Not the excesses, you see, but that attitude of saying, when I come to the Lord in prayer, I'm not coming to a God who can't be bothered. I'm not coming to a God who's already in bed or, or, you know, doesn't want to get up and stir up the animals, if you will. I'm coming to God who, in contrast to this guy in the parable, is going to answer us readily. You know, the, the biggest danger, I think, that robs us of the joy of being audacious in our prayer life is that sometimes we pray and, and, and we pray and we pray about something and we don't see an answer. And, and, you know, there are two equal and opposite errors sometimes we make. Sometimes people will say, well, you know, I, I prayed about it, nothing happened. They're, they're right up there with the people. I, I tried Jesus once and he didn't work for me. You know, I tried prayer once and it didn't work. Ah, oh, what's the difference? You know, I'll just kind of drift through my Christian life. I'm not really going to expect God to do much when I pray. And that's certainly an error. But the other error is this. We get to the point where we're praying and we're asking for the right thing, but we really don't expect to see anything happen. True story. Uh, uh, you know, one of the greatest, most radical answers to prayer I have ever experienced in my walk with God came after I drifted into that territory. You see, I was the first person in my immediate family to become a born-again Christian. And let me tell you something, it really rattled the household. I've confessed to you before, I'm a recovering adult child of an attorney. I used to have to resent legal briefs to get the car keys growing up. And man, when I became a born-again Christian, my dad didn't believe in God. He used to rake me over the coals, you know, and people say, how do you answer those skeptics' questions? I go, well, I've been asked them by people whose opinions I actually care about, you know. I, I, I've been grilled by the experts. And from the get-go in my walk with God, I prayed every day that my dad would come to know the Lord. Every day I'd pray for that. And, you know, pray for that. Months go by. Come on, God, you got to do this. Pray, years go by. Well, God, I'm, you know. Yeah, you're not willing for any to perish. No, I'll never repent. No, I'll just save my dad. And I would pray, you know, but I've got to confess to you, I never really expected God to do much about it. Because the more I prayed, it seemed the farther away from God my dad tended to get. But I did it because it was the right thing. You know, I did it because, you know, you, you're supposed to do these sort of things. Not that you actually expect God to do something. Until one Friday, my dad had been struggling with lymphoma cancer for the better part of six years. He had gone through a time of remission. He calls me up on a Friday and he goes, uh, you know, I don't know how to tell you this, son. I just uh, met with my oncologist and I got some really bad news. The lymphoma's back and apparently it's in a really dangerous part of my body. I'm going in for another CT scan. They're going to see how far this thing's progressed uh, and I'll let you know what's going on. And I went, wow, you know, I'm really sorry uh, about that, Dad. My dad calls me back and he goes, man, it, it, the bad news has gotten worse this guy says, uh, my adrenal gland is 80% compromised. I guess your adrenal gland controls about 52 things your body needs to live. And his oncologist told him, you better get your affairs in order. You've probably got no more than two months to live. And you know, I'm just stunned and shocked, and I didn't really even think about it. But it, almost a reflex reaction, I, I said, well, Dad, can I pray for you? And there's a long pause, and he said, well, okay. And I, I oh, okay, <laughs> what are you saying? You know, I didn't pray some hooping and hollering, come out, foul demon of cancer, yeah, yeah, kind of TV evangelist prayer. I just said, Lord, I, I am so broken over what my dad shared with me. I, I pray, if possible, you would heal him, but, but whatever happens, Lord, I, I pray you would show my dad how much you love him. In Jesus' name, amen. And there was this kind of long pause afterwards, and he said, well, you know, again, um, uh, you know, I'm getting the results of the second scan back on Monday. I'll let you know how it goes. So my dad calls me on Monday, and he goes, oh, my gosh, you won't believe what happened. I just met with this doctor, and I sat down with him. You won't believe what he said? I said, what did he say? And he said, well, I sat down with this guy, and he looked at me, and the first words out of his mouth were these, Mr. Richards, are you a religious man? And my dad said, well, no, not particularly. Why do you ask? And he said, well, 
I have the CT scan we took that shows the 80% compromise on your adrenal gland. There it is. I can show it to you right there. I have the follow-up scan that we took on Friday. There is not a trace of the cancer. There's not even a scar. He said, I have no scientific explanation for this. So I want to ask you, are you a religious man? And he said, my dad goes, oh, thank you so much for your prayers. Thank you. for." I said, dad, 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 it wasn't my prayers. It was God. He's trying to tell you something. He's trying to tell you how much. My dad, as a result of that, gave his life to Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you something about that. That was an instant answer to prayer that was 20 years in the making. I prayed every day for my dad to be saved. And truth be told, if you see it on the heavenly replay, some of my prayers for my dad's salvation were pretty doggone lame. Ah, I know it's not going to happen, but save God, save him anyway. Could you imagine what would have happened if I'd quit praying a week before that happened? Ah, it's never going to happen. You got to be audacious. You got to believe that even if you're not seeing what's going on, there's more going on underneath the sight of human eyes and and our ability to comprehend than we could ever even imagine. Prayer is not just about God changing those outward circumstances and praise God He did in my dad's case, but it was all about changing me. It was about me persevering even when I didn't see results. It was getting that name it and claim it stuff out where, you know, I'm going to believe you for this God and you better deliver in about five minutes. No, God had to teach me those kind of lessons that I could learn nowhere else. Then praying and keeping on praying. And Jesus teaches us this story here for that purpose. Listen to how he follows up. Here's the so what of his story. So I say to you, ask and it will be given what you seek. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. To him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? If he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, understand what Jesus is saying here. The language here in the original is fascinating. When Jesus says, ask... And it will be given what you ask for. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. The nuance in the original language is ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. And you're going to see results. Why? Because Jesus himself, the one who answers our prayer, said what? For everyone who asks, what? Gets blown off by God? No. Everyone who asks, what? Receives. He who seeks is going to be lost and clueless. No, he who seeks, what? Finds. Him who knocks, what? The door is going to be open. Now, don't get me wrong. You might find yourself in a place where you're knocking for quite a while. You might be looking at your knuckles and say, man, they're getting a little raw here. But I'm going to believe you, Jesus, when you say these things. Why? Because Jesus is showing again the contrast between the guy who doesn't want to get out of bed and your heavenly father. It says, you are fathers out there. If your child asks you for something good, are you going to give him something threatening, something that is life-denying, something that's going to cause them pain and suffering? No. And then Jesus gives the kicker here. And if you, being evil, <laughs> you fallen, sinful human beings who basically do everything wrong, got one thing right. You know how to take care of your kids. Most of you die for your kids, right? You guys got that one right. If you being evil know how to do that, how much more will your heavenly Father, now catch this, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask for him. Now notice how Jesus defines the ultimate answer to prayer. It's not how much more will your heavenly Father give a winning number for the publisher's clearinghouse to those who ask for him. He didn't say, how much more will your heavenly father, you know, give a miraculous intervention and a healing in a situation with cancer? No, but he says something even better. He says, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Why does he say this? Well, it kind of goes back to something God said to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 15, God revealed to Abraham that Abraham was going to be blessed. 
And he said to Abraham, Abraham, having a bouncing baby boy at the age of 99 is your exceedingly great reward. He didn't say that. He said, Abraham, being the father of many nations is going to be your exceedingly great reward. He didn't say that. Abraham, you're going to have flocks and herds and more than you could ever want. No, he didn't say that. That wasn't exceedingly great. God said to Abraham this. He said, I am your exceedingly great reward. And so when Jesus said, how much more is your heavenly father going to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Maybe this is where we go afoul most in prayer. We aim too low. We say, God, bless my finances. God, bless my family. And there's definitely a place for all of that. But what greater blessing could God give to you and me than to say, God, could you please allow the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Remember Romans 14, 19? The kingdom of God isn't eating or drinking, but what? Righteousness, a right relationship with God, peace that comes through His love, joy and the hope of everlasting life in the Holy Spirit. you got the Holy Spirit. you got it all. You've got God in you, God coming upon you, God creating beautiful fruit within your life, God loving through you in a way that you never dreamed possible, radically revolutionizing every other relationship you got. If you can have that, why settle for less? How much more? How much more? That contrast there. Boy, read through Romans chapter 5, you Bible scholars. And see this much more mentality that is all over the gospel of Jesus Christ. How God wants to give you so much more than you ever dreamed. Not the piddly little stuff like your own Learjet. Not the piddly little stuff like, you know, having more money than you know what to do with. He wants to give you himself. He wants to give you a relationship with himself. So you got that. You got it all. So don't settle for less. You want passion in your walk with God, number one, make sure you're aiming at something. Aim at nothing, you'll always hit it. Never more true than when you pray. Allow the Lord's structure that he has laid out here in Luke chapter 11 to guide your prayer life. Secondly, understand it's okay to be audacious when you pray. It's okay to to come to God and say, this is what I passionately want, Lord. Nevertheless, not your will, but mine be done. But this is what I want to see happen. I'm going to believe you for that, God. Man, that is a powerful expression of faith. Don't shy away from that. And finally, don't settle for anything less than God's best. Don't pray for anything apart from how it's going to impact and draw you closer to the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, the self-control, the very love of God that he wants to give you personally through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You got those gifts, you're rich indeed. Lord, thank you that we have this glorious opportunity, not just to talk about prayer, but now as we move into this time of communion, to understand what makes prayer possible, why we can even speak to you and be heard at all, fallen and sinful as we are. It was because your son Jesus took our place when he died on the cross. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Thank you for that glorious reconciliation we celebrate today. And Lord, even as we spend some time worshiping, I pray that you would prepare our hearts for this beautiful remembrance of how invested you are in us. And and even as we take communion, I pray you would remind us, if you didn't spare your only son, but gave him up for us all, How will you not along with him freely give us all things? Thank you for loving us in this way. Prepare us to remember Jesus now. In his name and for his sake, Father, we ask. Amen.